the deer hunt. Do you have any idea what that means? <laughs> Michael McElanus, DOE, I might. What what in particular did they did they it's, just say? What are the changes in the deer hunt? And, and, I, and I gave them a, the face I probably just gave Zach. <laughs> like I don't know. But then they said we they, they said well you guys knowing that I'm on the cab so obviously it's me. Sure. Um, that you're changing the changing the way the radiation's addressed or some I, and I really <clears throat> didn't understand what they were asking. No, what what they're probably referring to, there are some areas of the site that we don't normally let deer hunts occur in. <clears throat> there are some soil contamination areas. We are changing the way we're managing those soil contamination areas because of some internal concerns that have been raised up. We're, in fact, revisiting that entire policy. But the change that they're probably referring to in the deer hunt was last year we stopped um, we, we didn't do some deer hunts in some quadrants and we stopped the dog hunting and instead went to deer stand hunting. And I understand there might have been some of the local hunters who really liked the dog hunting because it was a little more effective. Um, so, so the stand hunting is a little less popular, but we're also doing some things to try and draw the deer away from the roads, which is a safety concern for us, and bring them closer to the areas where the stands are so that the hunters might be happy again. That might be the change. That that is a change that we made last year. That's probably what the hunter was referring to. But you're not doing that. We've been doing. That. Well, I, mean, I, I I just kind of wanted to be able to go back to that person and say this is what I found out. Thank you. Sure thing. Glad to help. Are there any more questions of Zach Todd? Zach, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Okay, uh, we've got. What's next on our, listed on our agenda is, it's called committee discussion. Um, and the bullet points say things like unmanned aircraft systems, historical preservation, budget update. Um, we've got recommendations that have been drafted uh, by members of the CAB <clears throat> that basically address these um, committee discussion points. So what I thought I'd do, if uh, the committee is okay with this, is uh, we would go right into the draft recommendations because they'll address uh, the discussion points that are listed here. Um, <clears throat> the, the order that I thought we should go in uh, is, is kind of the order that we've been receiving these recommendations uh, via email. So the first one was the uh, drone spotting over SRS. Uh, Nina Spinelli, uh, Spinelli is the recommendation manager. Nina had prepared a, a, an original draft on this recommendation. We discussed it at our last committee meeting. Nina has been uh, interested enough to redraft this recommendation. And um, so I think we should discuss that one first. And then before we discuss that, then the uh, Nina also uh, developed a recommendation about um, historical preservation curation facility and we should discuss that as well and then uh, Gil uh, as promised worked on a recommendation regarding his interest in the in the pension expense that's uh, you know responsibility of the uh, Savannah River site and uh, how we'd like to see that that pension cost uh, uh, realized or uh, demonstrated uh, to both the public and uh, to the cab. So let's start with, what I'd like to do is start with the drone spotting over SRS. Nina, you are the recommendation manager. Would you like to uh, introduce this updated recommendation to us? Sure, thank you, Bob. Um, so I'm sure most of you have probably had a chance to see it. It's not really different, um, the intent from the first one that we talked about a few months ago. The first three paragraphs are almost identical. When we get into the fourth one, we add a sentence at this time the operators of the spotted drone or drones have yet to be identified. Um, while the debate on drone usage continues to play out in the business world, media and court, safety concerns do exist for flying drones over SRS. Drivers of cars who work on site are required to possess a license and insurance, providing a level of safety and accountability. <coughs> However, drone operators are not required to have insurance. If a car accident occurs on site, the car has a VIN, a license, and an operator that can be located. If a drone falls from the sky and causes injury, it could be near impossible for the operator to be located. 
When people enter the site and perform work, they have an expectation of a safe work environment. With drones flying overhead by operators, it should be whose credentials, and training are unknown, a risk occurs for drone-related injuries. More so, a private citizen is unable to walk onto the site and take photographs of buildings and structures. When a drone operator flies over the site, they bypass identification and security checks and are able to freely roam around the site. If a person is unable to move freely in a restricted area, then a drone should follow suit. At this time, the drone activities are unknown. In recent news, the Trump administration is looking to Congress to allow the federal government to track, hack, and destroy any, it should be type, instead of time, mm -hmm. yeah. of drone over domestic soil with expectations to laws <clears throat> that already govern surveillance, computer privacy, and aircraft protection, according to a recent New York Times article. While looking for a balance between civil liberty and safety, the government has voiced ongoing concern about small drone proliferation, including one that crashed over the White House fence in 2015. There are also growing concerns that as technology grows, drones will have the potential to carry objects and the potential for terrorists to use them to deploy weapons onto secure areas is a reality that cannot be ignored. And so the recommendations and that background took into account some of the discussion that we had at the last committee meeting and several um, responses that I received. Recommendation. Given the nature of sensitive material housed at the site and public concern over reported spottings of UASs, the Savannah Riverside CAB recommends the Department of Energy continue investigating the drone sighting as allowed within its own agency regulations, continue to work with needed authorities to understand and implement the best use of airspace over the site to protect site activities and workers, and three, to provide updates to the SRS CAB about findings related to the UAS. So if any of y'all have any um, comments or feedback, Okay, questions? Uh, David Hoyle, go ahead. Uh, Nina, I think this is a, a very well written uh, recommendation. I have a couple of uh, suggestions, mm -hmm. uh, but let me say at the beginning that I, I have no problem with the uh, final recommendations in this thing. Um, that being said, in the second paragraph, you uh, have a couple of th uh, things that might be just uh, errors. And one is, it says, included at the site are canyons that downblend uranium and plutonium over 10,000 bundles of used nuclear fuel. I believe the accurate number is over 3,000. In fact, you had a H Canyon recommendation mm -hmm. last week that used the 3,000 number. and. Uh, there aren't 150,000 gallons of transuranic waste there. It's more like 750 cubic meters, not knowing how much has been sent to WIP this year. Or perhaps you were trying to refer to high level waste of which there's about 34 million gallons. So those are just uh, some suggested edits you. that you might want to make. Um, in the third paragraph, you talk about eight drone Eight drones were spotted. I, I don't, we don't know if it was eight drones or whether it was eight spottings of the same drone. And one thing we did learn from uh, the presentation that we got at the last uh, full board meeting was that all of those uh, sightings were unconfirmed. And you might want to note that as well. Um, because we, if they're unconfirmed, we don't really know if they even existed. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure somebody saw something. Um, that said, um, the other thing that I'm uncomfortable with is this focuses only on uh, unmanned aerial aircraft and frankly I think the same uh, concern could apply to any aircraft, not just mm -hmm. unmanned aircraft. Um, and uh, the, uh, the gentleman that briefed us uh, last month also wasn't able to identify any specific regulations that were violated, um, maybe because they couldn't confirm the sightings themselves. Um, and that uh, the, the surprising thing was is that the only restriction on airspace over Savannah River site that they identified was a a voluntary restriction mm -hmm. by uh, pilots and uh, that was also voluntary not to fly under 2,000 feet. That struck me as pretty loose. 
Um, and so I agree with your recommendations. I do believe that the airspace over secure facilities like the Savannah River site and other military installations ought to be uh, more restricted than they are now. In fact, uh, airports are restricted uh, in terms of flying space for unmanned aerial aircraft from a purely safety reason. Um, we ought to enjoy that same sort of restriction over secure facilities like the Savannah River site. Okay. Those Thank are my you. only comments. So those are good comments. So I was thinking for the third paragraph, mm -hmm. maybe we can change that to say during the summer of 2016, eight unconfirmed drone spottings over Savannah River site. That works. So we'll do that. And then if we can just get that second paragraph fact check to make sure that I've got the best info. I'm pretty sure I pulled that up from, I think it was one of the online pamphlets on the SRS website, so it could have been an outdated one that Google popped up. Yeah, I went on the website, uh, SRS's website, and looked up what I believe are the right numbers. Perfect. So I'll add that. And then do you want to... I don't want to put you on the spot right now, but maybe during the rest of the meeting, maybe come up with a recommendation number four to include not just the unmanned aircraft, but looking at restricting airspace for all aircrafts. Well, I think your, uh, your second recommendation, continue to work with needed authorities to understand and implement the best use of airspace over the site. I think that's broad enough to cover any aircraft because you don't use the word drones mm -hmm. in number two and so I think that's fine. Okay. Uh, Nina, just to counterpoint to David, drones are different than, un than manned aircrafts and that's what we heard from the gentleman last month whenever. I think there's a clear distinction between drones and manned aircraft and I disagree with that change because of that. What change? to include manned aircraft as well. We just agreed not to change it. Yeah. So we're just gonna but leave it. So gonna, I think we're gonna leave it as number two, which is continue to work with the new authorities to understand and implement the best use of airspace. I think when I was writing that, probably at some weird time in the middle of the morning, um, I didn't use the word drone. I think because of that, mm -hmm. because I couldn't figure out what the difference was at the time between UASs and drones. Mm -hmm. So I didn't. Okay. I my under, my misunderstanding. Yeah. Yep. Can we just add a period at the end of that too? And then I think um, if there's no more discussion on this particular one, I did get some feedback and we didn't add it as number four, but I was hoping James could kind of bring it up and, and talk us through it. There was a suggestion for number four about um, asking the Savannah River site to maybe look at drone, is it up there? Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you, because I couldn't remember it. I don't have my glasses on, but it, I think I wrote it. Consider partnering. Like Consider partnering with sister agencies to utilize site resources for drone testing. <clears throat> Not really, um, but <laughs> <laughs> part of part of the the feedback that I got was that SRS has so many different tools under its belt that it might consider taking the lead if it becomes available drone research. If there if there's interest in it, and it's something that would align with their strategic plan in the future, what the site activities can do to help understand anti-drone and drone research. Did I say yeah. that right? I probably yeah. didn't. Um, no, I, I thought it sounded okay. Um, just wanted to kind of share a little nugget for you all, so uh, kind of a little bit of context into this recommendation. Um, it was very preliminary, um, so we didn't get a lot of headway, but currently the military, specifically the state of South Carolina, was looking for a place to kind of do exactly what you were saying um, and use it as a training, specifically the area west of 125. Do uh, what? For the, the like test drones and stuff like that. Um, so th that is something that we have kind of looked at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we kind of went through the iterations and there was um, several issues uh, with that. Um, so we kind of took that off the table for, for the now. time being. But it is, a, it is a nice idea that SRS can continue expanding its missions without having to bring in you know, materials and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't dispute that. I, I just, it sort of kind of comes out of the blue. <laughs> it does. Forgive the pun. Uh, 
where there was no discussion of mm -hmm. that in the background or discussion parts of the recommendation. Just all of a sudden it talks about drone testing. I mean, either add something that provides the basis for number four in your background area or maybe consider making that a separate recommendation. That's what I was actually thinking as we were talking about this out loud is that I think there might be enough to do its own separate recommendation if the committee feels comfortable with that. That's what I would recommend. Uh, Bob Door Cab. Uh, Nina, I had a question too. Um, you know, I was thinking like, um, you know, there's reference to drone sightings mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, unidentified aircraft and um, can't we, um, I don't know, think it's unreasonable to ask uh, DOE, uh, how about some tracking information? In other words, a recommendation that says, you know, provide us, provide the cab with some tracking information. What, what are your findings? What are you, what are you actually seeing? You know, just keep some kind of a database of these things and, uh, and then we could get an update like we're getting an update from Zach Todd in regards to uh, how the facility is running. Um, because, you know, obviously if there was uh, a ramp up in the sightings or, there's, uh, or there are no sightings or, you know, if there are no sightings, then, you know, then uh, our concerns are not that big. But if there are sightings and then there's more sightings, uh, we could, you know, we could say, yeah, that this is becoming a, a bigger issue than what we originally anticipated. Uh, does, the, does this group see any value in, in identifying uh, or tracking the number of sightings that uh, a aerial aircraft, uh, re, uh, that's redundant, but air, aircraft in general? So maybe to provide updates and tracking information, because yeah. we have number three yeah. that right. says to provide yeah, updates to the SRS right. cab about findings related. So provide updates, uh, well, then provide updates and tracking information in regards to the findings of the UAS. I, I, okay. you know, I, be interested in some, some something empirical that says, mm -hmm. well, you know, we've seen this many, we've seen, you know, we've seen more, we've seen less. And not number. that I want to add more to this because I, <laughs> I don't, um, I get all, but, and I don't know how this would work, but for tracking information, do you track it when it's unconfirmed? Like who has, who on the site has to spot it for it to be confirmed versus unconfirmed? Like if I was there and I spotted it versus like, I don't know if you spotted it. Yeah, so Zach Todd, DOE, um, I'm, I'm familiar with kind of like the, the, the process, but I'm not sure where security draws the line as like what I can share and what I can't share, um, frankly. Um, another comment, I would just add like what metrics you guys are referring to with the traffic or tracking and the recommendation so um, we can be kind of specific with okay. it um, and kind of give you a better shot of like trying to get this. Bob to a cab. I mean, Zach, I, I, I was just envisioning, you know, some kind of account of uh, occurrences. Yeah, and, and that may be something that we can look at. Um, but when I say tracking and like, um, like, okay, I'm like, are we talking like time, dates, like uh, what type of aircraft, like the thread, exactly where it was, mm -hmm. what it was doing, yeah, you know, so awesome. there's so much information yeah. that can go with that. Um, oh. I would just try to be very specific about that information. Um, so maybe to provide updates and number of occurrences. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Dork, that's what I was thinking exactly. Just, okay. you know, just some kind of uh, tracking information, you know, uh, whether uh, if, if it's unident well, unidentified, identified, I don't know. It, it, I, con thank you. That's the right terminology. Uh, if it's confirmed, unconfirmed, but it, it's, you know, we, you can see, we can see if it's, in the, if it's increasing or decreasing, um, you know, if it's, it's something that's truly a threat to SRS, it might might work out that way. Right, right. yeah. No, I, I kind of understand the overall intent. I'm um, just trying to kind of uh, expand tracking, what, what exactly that means. And I think we're on the right track. Um, and I did remember this, that um, Monte Volk, he, he briefed the drones. He, he did say, like, uh, currently the process, you know, so, like, you're out on the site and somebody sees a drone kind of coming and security does respond to that sighting. So that that's probably the, the first two steps in the process um, right there. So maybe we can add a number. Go ahead.
made me aware of this. I filed a Freedom of Information Act request to get any kind of information, certainly not uh, the security nature, uh, about any drones uh, over the site, and absolutely nothing has been provided. So I think the to your question is, there, you know, no information has been provided to, to document those drones, at, at least uh, to me. So I'm quite confused about why nothing has been provided, and I missed the presentation at the last full cap meeting, and I don't think it, as David said, really documented anything. So my opinion, Julie has a ways to go here, uh, so I, I would hope the recommendation addresses that. Um, and you can comment on that if you want. And one thing the, the recommendation does not address that I'm a little confused about also, and I ask you, there were some reports a couple of weeks ago that the Idaho National Lab is um, experimenting with use of drones for uh, remote radiation detection, mm -hmm. which uh, certainly seems like a good thing to me if it's needed. How does your recommendation apply to either DOE or contractor drones that might be used uh, over SRS? I would assume... Thanks, Tom. I would assume that if it's a DOE drone, it would be registered properly. If if you're using it, is that correct? Like if you were using, a, if you in the future you would be using a drone for work or research, I would assume that you wouldn't have people calling it into security. I would hope. <laughs> so Zach Todd, DOE. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, go so ahead. currently we have a policy that prohibits drones. Um, it's my understanding that there are some ex uh, exemptions for that, like if a contractor has like a justified use or mm -hmm. something of that nature. So it would fall into that process. Okay. Thank you. But it was raised with me that it might be contractors that were flying any possible drones that haven't been documented, and I've, I've just not seen any documentation, so I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what you're addressing here. Okay. David, did you have something that you wanted to add to it, too? Bob Dorcab, uh, Tom Clements, thank you for that uh, feedback. Um, I think that we. I got a suggestion to perhaps address his concern. In number three, where we talk about getting updates, you might want to just put the word unauthorized before UAS. Perfect. Because any DOE or contractor use of a drone on site would be authorized. That's a good suggestion. Thank you, David. Do we need to make a motion to take this to? Are there any other questions regarding this recommendation? Anyone online have any more questions? This is Dan Kaminsky, Cam. Um, Go ahead, Dan. I don't have any questions. Just a comment. Uh, David, thank you. You asked a lot of great questions. <coughs> uh, some of them were on my mind as well. And uh, excellent job on the recommendation, and I would support that's a good comment. I like that one. Thank you. <laughs> so he's allowed to speak again. He's allowed to speak David, again. David <laughs> Bobakis, do you have a... Uh, I, I just wanted to follow up with what... Uh, Dave Bobakis, Cap, with what David just said. I, um, is there any such thing today as an unauthorized drone? Yeah. Yeah, the ones mm -hmm. that yeah. were okay. apparently spotted last year were all unauthorized. Okay. Yeah, this recommendation has been about a year in the works. It's just come through several reiterations before the, the committee felt comfortable moving forward. Bob Durkamp, so, because uh, I'm going to go back to my question again. So are we going to ask DOE to provide us with some tracking information? I was going to use the word um, occurrences okay. to provide updates. To oh. the cab to provide updates. And number three. Yeah, uh, for number three to provide updates and numbers of occurrences of unauthorized okay. occurrences to the SRS cap about findings related to okay. unauthorized UASs. Yeah. Is that that Bob Door cab? That's fine with me. Okay. So are you are you keeping number four? Or are you dropping? Number I think four? I'm gonna drop number four for now and maybe come back as an actual recommendation on its own. 
What is, does the committee feel like that would be best for it to stand? Yeah. To be a standalone? Yeah. yeah. All right, Gil, you're going to write that one with me. Okay. Bob uh, Dorcab, so number, Nina, number four is actually going to be removed then? If, if that's what the committee feels comfortable with. Yeah. Okay. And I if don't know if we have time. I don't want to do it, but like maybe during our next point of contact update, if maybe, Zach, if you would feel comfortable giving us sort of more of a, an update about what number four could be, whatever you would be allowed to share with us, that we could turn into a separate recommendation. Zach Todd DOE. Uh, yeah, so um, we'd love to work with you guys to try to figure out what that uh, could look like. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Bob, is that good for you? That's fine with me. Um, whoever's editing this recommendation, are we going to remove number four then? Just kind of. Just do like a little straight through. Just so. And then, are there any other questions regarding this recommendation? Okay, could we. Uh, make a motion within this committee to uh, accept or or not accept this recommendation. Anyone want to accept it? Second. Okay, it's been seconded. Uh, all those in favor in this committee of moving this recommendation to the full board? Okay, I think we've got unanimous approval yes, of the do. committee. Okay, so this recommendation will move forward to the full board in July. Thank you. Nina, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, next recommendation. Nina, you're on board again. You've been working like hard. Sick of we hearing appreci me. We appreciate <laughs> it. Um, and this one, uh, I have a fond interest in it too. I think uh, historical preservation, um, understanding the history of the SRS is very uh, interesting and important. And um, so the title of this recommendation is the creation facility. And, um, you know, in reading this recommendation, I liked it. Um, to me, the focus was, you know, um, expanding the uh, opportunity for people, and uh, uh, well, the public in general to understand better uh, what SRS is all about in the history. And, uh, but to do that, we've got to allow for, uh, easier access. So Nina, would you again like to lead the discussion on this recommendation? Thanks, Bob. You actually did great <laughs> just actually introducing it. So this recommendation just came out of the wonderful tour that we had a few months ago and the presentations that we've, we've had. Um, this is the first time we're seeing it, so I'm open to suggestions for the recommendations, any wording or thoughts that you all might have. I'm not going to read the background because you had it and I think everyone has enough copies. Um, and I hate how I sound on the microphone. So for recommendation, given the historic value housed in the collection of the curation facility, the Savannah Riverside Citizens Advisory Board recommends that the Department of Energy, one, continue to expand tours of the curation center to interested members of the public, two, work with agency partners to move, move the curation center towards growing into a museum, three, work with SRNS and the curation subcontractor to develop a plan to adjust the location of the facility to allow for greater public participation. At this time, the facility is housed within site boundaries and towards this facility require a lengthy vetting process. Four, work with local school districts to establish a traveling curriculum and display that can be incorporated by local schools. And fifth, continue to work with local community partners who have a vested interest in site history to develop a strategic plan for community displays and participation. Um, for number four, we had a presentation at our full board last month, and that was something that they actually had been doing. Um, I think it was at a school in Augusta, which is where number four came from. So any thoughts or suggestions, Bob? Uh, okay. Normally I ask the other committee members first, anybody? But I'll be glad to <laughs> start with the questions. Again, I, I like the recommendation, uh, Bob Dorcab, I like the recommendation. Um, you know, I'm just, um, I'm wondering how much uh, how much flexibility um, DOE has to uh, number one locate the creation facility uh, to for greater p public participation, and then um, you know the fact that it's housed within the site boundaries. Let, let's say let's assume that it stays there. Um, you know, can 
DOE allow uh, allow for easier, uh, you know, the, I, my understanding of these public tours is that um, the people can't get out of the bus. So if they go to this curation facility, they just drive by it, they don't actually go in it. DOE, can you clarify that? Susan Clisby, DOE, no, the new historic tours go to the curation facility. And I, I actually have been on one already, and uh, it's quite wonderful. So, but but as Nina pointed out, you do have to sign up in advance, and there's a you know a limited number, and you have to provide all your information just like any other tour. Bob Dorcab, then is that a, a, a special tour, or is that it's it's the new one? Well, we've spoken to you about it a couple of times. It just started in April. They had the first two in April and May, and there will be two more this calendar year. And I don't know. If SRNS, you know, they run the tour program. I'm not sure, but I think probably next year there's been such demand. There will probably be more. So and they go to other, they go to like um, old Ellington and, and so forth. Okay, so Bob Dorcat, so is that um, is that advertised extensively yes. then? Yes, we we've been right. doing a great deal to get the word out. It's been busy, and but it again, it's like it's just like the normal tour. You have to have what is it? I should know this by now. Two forms of ID that are approved forms of ID, and it's nice. a, it's okay. I got on. <laughs> so the important thing is, but I mean, so like if you were just gonna go take your kids, like Larry pointed out in the last meetings, that's a lot of work. Versus if you were just gonna go to like the museum in downtown Aiken. So that's where I think that recommendation came from, was. <clears throat> and that's why I think I, I had the museum part too is either figuring out if there's going to be a way that they can allow greater greater access to it and if they can't which is understandable because it's behind site boundaries as they move more towards the museum figuring out if there's space on the other side of the site boundary that they could use as a museum David um, <clears throat> David Hall cab I, I, I don't know if this was emphasized during your tour. It was during a time I went to the curation center. The curation facility is not a museum. Mm -hmm. It's specifically designed to store historical and prehistoric artifacts uh, from the Savannah River site. Now they, they do share those artifacts with other museums and, uh, and other activities. So I just wanted to make sure I'm a little uncomfortable uh, with a recommendation saying adjust the location of the curation facility. Uh, it, just establishing that facility was a huge uh, uh, success for the Savannah River site. It was a long time in, in mm -hmm. getting there. And now to suggest that it should move makes me a little uncomfortable. By and large, though, I, I support this recommendation because I think we all recognize that the artifacts that are housed there are of keen interest to the community, um, but I, I'm uncomfortable with suggesting they move the curation facility and, and make it into a museum. That's not its, that's not its purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Bob, uh, Bob Durkamp. You know, I, I was just thinking, like, the uh, with Joe Ortalto, the, the uh, heritage mm -hmm. um, uh, SRS Heritage Museum that's in downtown Aiken. Um, you know how like, uh, David made a good point, in my opinion, about curation. Uh, well, you know, the the uh, uh, archiving of, of the art, the archiving of SRS at, at the curation facility, it's not a museum, but yet there is a museum in downtown Aiken. Um, I'm not trying to solve the uh, solve the recommendation for DOE, but um, <coughs> you know, if, you know, like, you know how like uh, um, uh, rare art and objects of interest are shared to museums from you know some place mm -hmm. like some collaboration between SRS and that Heritage Museum would be kind of interesting, and um, so again, I'm, I'm brainstorming, but. Uh, could a suggestion within this recommendation be made that way, that there's some collaboration? Uh, DOE's got a comment. Go ahead. Susan Clisby, DOE, I think that would be an excellent recommendation. Um, I know that there is collaboration planned. Um, it, they're, they're just getting open, or, or just growing, I guess, into their space. 
but um, that would be an excellent addition to the recommendation. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I think number five. You'd like, Nina, you'd like to, to add that. something to we, that? Yeah, we can look at wording for that because I tried to keep number five open okay. to allow for community partners because the, the Heritage Museum was something I had been thinking about and also the um, the local Aiken Museum as well. I know part of, part of issues with museum loans is security yeah. because the security that they may have for their artifacts may not yeah. match up to the security, yeah. unfortunately, that, that loans. Um, where it will be housed. But David, for yours, I'm thinking maybe work with SRNS and the curation subcontractor to develop a plan to allow for greater public participation. That's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that would make me feel much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bobby? Bobby Williams Camp. I just wonder if any of the items from the curation facility are incorporated into the state museum. Yeah. Maybe for number five, add after the comma, including the Heritage <coughs> Museum of Aiken County. Is it the museum? Is it the Heritage Museum of Aiken County, or is it just the Heritage Museum? David, do you know? You're supposed SRS to know that. I, I thought it was the SRS Heritage. Okay, so the SRS Heritage Museum and the State Museum of South Carolina. Is everyone good with those changes or additions? Oh, I, I like that, Nina. Bob Dorcab. I I like that. That you know, you actually you did address kind of my concerns in number five, and um, but I think yeah, you're identifying the actual facilities that could where the sharing of uh, artifacts could be. Uh, Starting gate. Yes, and then of course the public access to those uh, museums are uh, not an issue. So mm -hmm. that that would. That'd be a nice gesture on SRS's part if they could do that. Does anyone else have any feedback? Any thoughts on it? Okay. Uh, are there any? Uh, Nina's already asked, but I, I'll ask once again. Bob Dorcab, is there are any additional comments in regards to this recommendation? Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask if. A motion can be made to either accept or deny this recommendation. So, moved. so you're accepting the recommendation, Gil? Uh, is there a second on that? I'll second it. Okay. That's been seconded. Uh, all those in favor of uh, accepting this recommendation, please raise your hand. Okay, so we're going to move this recommendation to the full board in the July meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, Nina, good job. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy that I can push that away now. <laughs> okay, um, now we have another recommendation that's been prepared by Gil Allensworth, and it's regards to uh, Gil's question that he asked at the um, May full board meeting. We had a budget update. Um, John Lopez, you know, gave us some good information in regards to what's happening with 2018 and 2019. Gil asked a very good question, in my opinion, about pension costs and, you know, the need for more money at SRS, EM budget, uh, but then so much of this money seems to be allocated to legacy benefits. And so how does that impact uh, the progress of, you know, Getting rid of, <coughs> getting rid of the waste and, and containing the waste that's at uh, Savannah River site. So, uh, Gil, as promised, has uh, started his recommendation, um, and I read the outline of this. Well, I read the recommendation, and of course, you were just looking for um, numbers and empirical information to put in here. Well put. Okay. So, Gil, would you like to talk about this recommendation to the committee, and then if DOE has some information that they want to share with us, and then you can tell us how you'd like to finalize this recommendation, yeah. Gil. Thanks, Bob. Hey, Gil. That was very well put. Can I ask you real quick, which uh, version of this? Do you want the one? We're not. Either one of them? I'm not we'll just. A, I'm not going to put Then a, don't put up either one of them right yeah, now, I'm Chelsea. Gonna put a mo I'm not going to put a, a, a um, recommendation through today, but we can discuss it, Bob. The re uh, DOE did... Uh, Yeoman's work to get all, I mean, I asked for a ton of information and they tried to um, 
give it the best they could and still get the recommendation and get, get this recommendation to the table. I'm not happy with the recommendation, so I'm pulling it. Um, it's much further. Um, I received four, is the beginning of this committee meeting, I received four pages of that empirical data, and I believe, is there, co I mean, I think there's yep. copies for everybody, if you'd like to have it, um, that I will use as I go in and clean, and clean up the uh, recommendation. But a quick review, Bob. Yeah, thank you. 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, yeah, um, there was zero contributions made to the pension plan. Um, you know, and I, it, it's going to take a lot of number crunching and things along that. And also because of what I do for a living, I have a little bit different insight into this maybe than some. But I read, as I just read through it quickly, I ask in, I ask in question number six on page four, the years DOE or other entity removed money from SRSEM pension due to it being overfunded and where did that money go? Uh, I dropped to the final sentence of their response and the remaining 386 million overfunding was used by the department for other mission priorities. In 1990, 1989, $386 million. It was quite a bit of money if you don't consider it a, bit of money, a good bit of money today. To give you an idea um, to the committee, um, anyone that is done investing over a long period of time, 3% interest is low, but at a 3% compounded interest, that money would be worth $866 billion today. Um, if we did a 6% compounding interest, that would be worth $1,942,635,000. I, I apologize, I said $866 billion. It would be worth $866,815,848 at 3% interest. At 6% interest, it would be worth $1,942,635,468. Um, that knocked the wind out of me. That's more than our annual budget for the entire site, EM and otherwise. So to go back and take a look at some of these things and to give you the committee an idea of where I'm going and the reason I said 80 98, 99, 2000, 2001, that was not, the pension was not funded. <clears throat> Historically, if you look at 98, 99, 2000, 2001, those were phenomenal boom years in the stock market. 2001, you may remember we had the tech bubble and the stock market lost quite a bit. We had 2008, we had the Great Recession. We can call it a lot of different things depending on what you know it as. Since 2009, we've been in a phenomenal boom cycle. In the, we are at all-time highs on the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Stock markets are doing extremely well. It scares me, and I'm not, and please, I'm not trying to over-dramatize it. It scares me that we will repeat what has happened in the past. The stock market's doing great. The pension's overfunded. So we're just going to stop funding it. And guess what? We're going to have another 2001. Or we're going to have another 2008. I don't think we will. But this pension is, has a ton of strain on it. Now, because I'm passionate about it, I've gone and researched and I've talked to Michael Michelinis. I've talked to a lot of people at DOE. We are the only site that this happened to. It didn't happen at Hanford, it didn't happen at Los Alamos, it didn't happen, you pick it. It didn't happen. This is an issue above the CAP's head. This is an issue, I believe, above SRS DOE's head. I think that they are doing the best job they possibly can, you know, running the site and making sure our retirees and future retirees are protected. That is the reason that this recommendation to me is is a very important recommendation and I don't want to feel rushed and push it to the committee I want it to be clear I want the powers that be and I don't know who they are I have my ideas but I don't know who they are to hear about it because we have a lot of people in Aiken County in Columbia County in Richmond County in Edgefield County 
in Barnum County. In, in Jasper, I mean, we have people all around that are affected. We have people that are making, that are getting a pension of sixteen hundred dollars. And I have this conversation with people: Oh, the pension can never go away. The pension can't. Tell the people of Detroit that. So this is important, and I'm passionate about it. This is what I do for a living. I care about people's retirement. I care about their well-being, and I care about their legacy. And that's what we're talking about here. So. Those are just some quick highlights. I appreciate DOE getting me this information. And uh, I, I apologize for having to pull back the recommendation, but it's that important that I want some time to go over the numbers before I just say, let's go ahead and throw out a recommendation. So thanks for the time, Bob. Bob Dorcab. Gil, um, I also share your uh, concerns, being a, a financially oriented person and so you worked too. in the industry. Um, you know, I, I find kind of interesting with this, now that you have some information, is uh, that, uh, you know, in that time frame that you uh, pointed out, 98 through 2001, when the stock market was uh, way up and uh, interest rates were much higher. Yeah. So even if you were investing in bonds, the rate of return was much, much better. Uh, not just uh, the federal government, but certainly uh, private pension plans, they all uh, stopped funding their pensions because they were overfunded. But unlike the private pension plans and these, and of course even municipal pension plans like, you know, at the state level and uh, local government levels, they get underfunded and they can't just print money like the federal government. And they can't just ring up the debt like the federal government. So what you don't, in my opinion, what you don't hear is that uh, the federal pension plan is underfunded and I think the reason you don't hear that is because they just assume they can uh, appropriate more money in in future years budgets either through tax increases or just increasing the deficit year over year but of course the the deficits uh, are so overwhelming now with the federal government that uh, in the next down cycle which will happen uh, <laughs> There's not going to be, um, you know, the, the deficits are going to balloon to the point where uh, somebody's going to have to take a hit for this. And so your concern is, I think, very valid. These these people that are going to depend on a federal pension uh, could be at risk. Is that fair to say? Yes. And I appreciate you saying, I don't know what the federal government's going to do about printing money or whatever. But I do, in uh, Zach and I, in the few, few moments we had before, I was talking about uh, President Obama's administration came out with the Department of Labor fiduciary rule that would, it affects all pensions, 401ks, IRAs, retirement accounts. And there's, and uh, those that have, it hasn't been a headline grabber, but it's been in the news. Um, but for those that haven't been paying attention to it, 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 part of it went into effect last Friday. Now, from a public pension standpoint, there's question of how that's going to be, how that new rule is going to be applied. Now, from a private pension um, holder, there, they, it's a fiduciary rule. We can get into the ifs and nuts and what's and all that about fiduciary, but fiduciary takes it to a legal standard. I don't know what that means to the government, but I do know what it means to me. And if I mishandled money this way, I would be sued and maybe even criminal, held criminally um, accountable. Probably not that far, but maybe. So, I'm. It, it, I, this is. It probably won't happen, Bob. It probably won't be a disaster. But you know what? <laughs> Historically, it could be. Um, and we need and and. The powers that be, and I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to start throwing names out. The powers that be have to hear it loud and clear. Yeah. And for for others on the cab, you know, it, that this is going to affect EM missions as currently constituted, because EM missions are going to have to feel the feel the pain of these budget cuts for pension. So the missions are, there, some people are going to have to make some tough decisions. Are we not going to replace a melter and we're just going to sit and not have a melter for two years? Just popped in my mind. I don't know. Are we not, are we going to have to lay off a thousand people and, and be running in a skeleton crew all the time 
because we have to pay this pension cost. I believe those will be the, those will be the decisions that, that the decision makers will be forced to make, not necessarily the pension being, you know, not people not receiving their funds. But that affects EM as much as it affects the pension, the pensionees, pensioners. So that, that's one of the things I have to, and I probably should just stop talking because those are the things I'm going to have to break down. Yeah. Uh, Bob Dorcab again. I, I, Gil, I, I, I share your concerns. And uh, the one question I have then, um, and maybe D. We can talk about it a little bit here today, or we can uh, table it till you finalize this recommendation. The contributions that are currently being made, you know, DOE's told us that, uh, that you know, there's a significant ramp up in pension contributions. So uh, are they, in fact, in a catch-up mode uh, with a reasonable implied interest rate of return on this pension, or is it, uh, are they really not catching up, or they're, they're so far behind, they're just throwing as much money at it as they can, and I don't know. I I can't answer that question. I yeah, know. right. But I so Gil, uh, just to wrap up then, because we're not going to vote on this recommendation tonight, because as you pointed out, it's not ready. Um, should we expect to see this in August or? Okay. I mean, I could have it. I could have it ready earlier. That's just the next that next meeting that it yeah. would be. be well, the that correct, that would be the correct time. Yeah. Okay, Bob Dorcap. So that would give you two months, and if you need more time, obviously. Uh, you could talk about that in August, but I appreciate uh, all the DOE gave me. They, they, these are some tough questions, and they had to go through a lot of stuff to get these answers. So, I appreciate it. Okay. Is uh, anybody else have any questions in regards to this recommendation? Actually, I'm, I just have a question, Gil. I don't understand how we got here. What is it that DOE or Savannah Riverside did? differently than the other sites that got us to this cliff and and i'm just reading from the because i don't have enough of a but i'm just reading in 1989 the group annuity contract from for the dupont pension plan was liquidated and distributed distributed as follows 725 million transferred to dupont for the pension liabilities of the workers they retained 246 million transferred to Westing wsrc for pension liabilities of workers they retain. The remaining 386 million over funding was used by the department for other priorities, other mm -hmm. mission priorities. That's a big deal, Dave. So the money was yeah. taken. So the money was taken from the pension Spun fund. Money, it, as, I read, as I read that, and as I read that, uh, there was, if we did the math, 725, 246, so we're now at 975 plus another, 386 were at a billion four and of a billion four well it was a little less billion three 386 million uh, was deemed overfunded and was used by the department for other mission priorities the money was taken out of the pension plan so because it was taken out of the pension plan it couldn't earn interest and compounding yeah, right. the compounding I mean the, now, the joke is about now we've got to make up what was lost that and the and the and the fact David, that we didn't, I mean, we being SRS and you know, just taking ownership of it, 88, I mean, excuse me, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, nothing, zero was put into the pension plan. Right. 2002, we put a sixth of a, six tenths of a percent of the budget into the plan. And I'm, and I'm just reading these numbers, so if I'm misspeaking, I apologize. I'm just reading off of what I've got here. No, I'm just, yeah, that's I have no head for this, so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. trying to understand what happened. Why was Savannah Riverside such a, uh, an anomaly amongst all of the DOE sites? Why was it allowed to happen? That's, that's, a, that's, that's a question for another recommendation. Um, I'm not going to go, I, I mean, that's a great question. I don't, don't be, I don't think poorly of it. I think that's a great question to ask. But, um. My recommendation will solely, solely focus on the pension and it going forward. I won't. Add, I'm not going to go in arrears. Um, you, if you recall, our uh, our charter is to provide uh, information and advice and recommendations to <laughs> DOE EM. 
That includes the Assistant Secretary of EM. Most of the time, our recommendations are addressed to the manager of Savannah Riverside, but you might want to consider addressing this particular recommendation to the Assistant Secretary. If it comes to that level, David, if that's something we want to look procedurally to do, um, maybe. But I think we just do the things the way you know the way we do them right now, and then escalate it if necessary. Yeah, this is Bob Dorcab again. Um, yeah, I, I think again, Gil, you've really uh, opened up some. You know, getting this information is going to be able to open up people's eyes to uh, a mistake that's been made. You know, federal government, but really municipalities across the country with these lavish pension plans. Uh, there was that period of time in the late 1990s when. Uh, you know, the GDP growth was uh, exponential at a very high rate. Um, employment was soaring, incomes were soaring. Uh, the stock market rate of return was very good. Uh, interest rates were very high in bonds. And so yes, pension uh, funds at that moment in time were underfunded, but it's, it's, it's incredible to me how myopic people are. You know, you're looking at a four year window of time where they didn't fund the pension plan and then, of course, you know what happens. It's, it's, the, it's the power of compounded money. It's as simple as that. If they even had made, you know, 50% haircut or 25% haircut on these pension contributions instead of a zero, 100% haircut, um, you know, you run out the numbers over a 20-year period of time and they wouldn't be committed to this kind of uh, significant pension investment that they have to make now. I don't want to thank you, Bob. I don't want to lose lose sight of because I, I do focus on the dollars. I don't want to lose sight of what it means to EM. That I mean, it's, and, and it's very easy for me to do that because I get tied down in the numbers. But the 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 key issue here is we have what you know. I asked Shelley last meeting. I mean. In, she wouldn't come out and say it, but one is, you know, we asked her the question about is Savannah River one of the most um, contaminated places on earth? I mean, you have reports, whether you agree with them or not, saying that's what Savannah River is, and then we are going to, and we have budget constraints that we hear about every year, and we are putting more pressure on that budget. That's, that's the concern. The concern is we have retirees and, and future retirees that need to make, get the money that they earned by working, their benefit that they agreed to, the benefit that they worked for, that they were <clears> promised. <throat> and then on the other hand, we have, and we have the Savannah River site that has ongoing missions that are needed for the next, forgive me for saying something incorrect, 40, 40 years. <clears throat> So we have, I mean, this is, this is the, it, in my opinion, this is the elephant in the room. Maybe not, maybe not for my time on the cap, but for the net, for the person that comes on this year, that they're going to be hitting the square in the eyes. Maybe by the time my site, I cycle off the cap, we won't have to deal with it. But Michael Michelinis or the, his counterpart or John Lopez or his counterpart when they presented the cab has got some pretty dreary stuff coming on the horizon and I think we sh and I think we should get out in front of it yeah. as a cab uh, Bob Dor cab uh, Gil I was just thinking too uh, going back to da David had a, his point before uh, and I was listening to what he was saying. Uh, why is SRS different than the other facility, the EM facilities? Uh, that might be kind of an interesting question to understand in the sense that, you know, like they take a Hannaford. They have government employees working at a, uh, well, they have, yeah, it's, it's a government facility. There's employees there. I don't know if they use contractors. Okay, so, but there's, there's pension costs there too, but uh, what we've heard when we've gotten the budget updates uh, from John Lopez at DOE here is that this problem is, is in fact specific to S SRS and not to the other facility. So um, I wonder if, if uh, just suggesting if you could incorporate why we're different than the other facilities. Yeah, that's that. It, like uh, Dave, Dave's got a great point, and I think that's a wonderful point. But I don't want to muddy this recommendation by 
debating the past. That's well, it's just an historical understanding of how we got there, and then and then you okay. get into the leading into okay, well, this is how it ha you know, I mean, this yeah. is how it happened, and now how are you going to deal with it going forward? Because in the Part end, of our recommendation is how don't ever it in again. the future. Yeah, don't ever let it happen again. Yeah. Yeah. You can't do that unless you know how it happened in the past. Did you? Have a question? I do. <laughs> uh, Dave Avagas, Cab. Um, so, Gil, when I uh, heard John Lopez speak back at our last meeting, um, I took some notes that said that this becomes a budget problem of $300 million for the first time in FY19. Is that... Uh, that's what he... I, re I don't have the notes, but that's what I recall. But in, I don't want to start getting into, getting into the data that they were giving to me. It does not look like that's reflected in this, but I have not, I have not gone through it. Uh, because it show, this is showing actually 2022, but so I don't know. But this, the, I think the information that I'm looking at was provided by the uh, plan actuaries, so I don't know the numbers they're using. I'm going to take them at face value. I'm not going to try to sit here and debate the actuarial numbers with them. I mean, uh, that that I don't know. But uh, I, I agree with you. That's John. John led. There, this is showing 201 million in the EM contribution of being 146 million in 2019, which seems about half of what John was implying to us. So, yeah, I feel you. I guess that's the best way we say it. I agree with you. But I don't know. I haven't had a chance to review. Zach Todd Dewey. Um, you know, not to like go point counterpoint, but I believe John. Um, mentioned that the in 2019 the the pension starts to become an issue um and it does i mean this is all this is always something that he's he spoke speaks on but it does come to a head in the, the 21 22 yeah, time frame that, but, but it, it was a shock he's Dave's hitting on something because john definitely intimated that it's quick it's coming quicker than we anticipated right and um so it, there there is it, you'll start to see it climb the big first jump right in that 19 time frame is yeah, my understanding um so it not that uh, it, it starts to become an issue then um and then it culminates in the the 300 and some million right. yeah. no that's good i agree with you. But, yeah, John did throw his curveball. okay yeah. i can't remember what he said yeah i agree with dave it was a curveball talked a lot more about it than i thought bob well thank thank you gil i think it did I, I like the recommendation. It'll be interesting to see it in August. And uh, are there any other uh, questions or concerns from the public or the uh, committee in regards to this recommendation? Okay. Uh, I At this point, we ask for public comment. Is there anyone in the public who would like to uh, step forward and make a public comment? Is there anyone online that would uh, like to make any comments or public comments, please? Okay, I don't hear anything. So uh, at this point, unless there's any other. This is John Clement, just to let you know, I've been listening. So thanks for the last discussion. Uh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your comments. Um, are there any other questions at this point? Is there any reason to. Uh, discuss anything further okay at this point I'd like to adjourn the meeting and I'd like to thank everyone and we'll see you in uh, July at the full board meeting thank you Drop the mic. Thank you,